Hi guys, Dane here, and today we're going to at the very least make a start on what is sure to be a massive review of Dance Macabre by Stephen King. This is a non-fiction collection, it's kind of part memoir, part guide to horror I suppose. Uh, released in about 1981-ish, I can check that for you I suppose. It was right towards the start of his career at any rate. Uh, first published in 1981. And so I'm going to read you the blurb and then I'm going to go through and share my tabs and then give you my overall thoughts and rating at the end. So, Dance Macabre is a unique combination of fantasy and autobiography, of classic horror writing honed to an unforgettable edge, an analysis of horror, terror and the supernatural in films, television and books by the best-selling master of the genre, Stephen King. Ranging across the whole spectrum of horror in popular culture and going back to the seminal classics of Count Dracula and Frankenstein, Stephen King describes his ideas on how horror works at many levels and how he brings it to bear in his own inimitable novels. So right at the bottom here, um, before we get started, he quotes Peter Straub in Ghost Story. He actually uh, kind of hero worships Straub a bit too much, I think, in this. But anyway, but he also quotes Eddie Cochran, come on everybody. Well, we'll really have a party, but we've got to post a guard outside. So um, he says, the genre we're talking about, whether it be in terms of books, film or TV, is really all one, make-believe horrors. And one of the questions that frequently comes up, asked by people who have grasped the paradox, but perhaps not fully articulated it in their own minds, is... Why do you want to make up horrible things when there is so much real horror in the world? The answer seems to be that we make up horrors to help us cope with the real ones. With the endless inventiveness of humankind, we grasp the very elements which are so divisive and destructive and try to turn them into tools to dismantle themselves. The term catharsis is as old as Greek drama, and it has been used rather too glibly by some practitioners in my field to justify what they do, but it still has its limited uses here. The dream of horror is in itself an outletting and a lancing, and it, went, and it may well be that the mass media dream of horror can sometimes become a nationwide analyst's couch. He says, The element of allegory is there only because it is built in, a given, impossible to escape. Horror appeals to us because it says, in a symbolic way, things we would be afraid to say right out straight, with the bark still on. It offers a chance to exercise emotions which society demands we keep closely in hand. The horror film is an invitation to indulge in deviant, antisocial behaviour by proxy, to commit gratuitous acts of violence, indulge our pure old dreams of power, to give in to our most craven fears. Perhaps more than anything else, the horror story or horror movie says it's okay to join the mob, to become the total tribal being, to destroy the outsider. It has never been done better or more literally than in Shirley Jackson's short story, The Lottery, where the entire concept of the outsider is symbolic, created by nothing more than a black circle coloured on a slip of paper. But there is no symbolism in the rain of stones which ends the story. The victim's own child pitches in as the mother dies screaming, It's not fair! It's not fair! He talks about um, a film called Freaks here as well, where apparently they use real freaks. Uh, this is the term King uses, obviously I'm pretty sure that is not the politically correct term for it. Browning made the mistake of using freaks in his film. We may only really feel comfortable with horror as long as we can see the zipper running up the monster's back, when we understand that we are not playing for keepsies. The climax of Freaks as the living torso and the armless wonder and the Hilton sisters, Siamese twins, among others, slither and flop through the mud after the screaming Cleopatra was simply too much. Even some of MGM's tame exhibitors flatly refused to show it, and Carlos Clarence reports in his Illustrated History of the Horror Film that, it, that at its one preview in San Diego, a woman ran screaming up the aisle. The film was exhibited, after a fashion, in a version so radically cut that one film critic complained that he had no idea what he was watching. Clarence further reports that the film was banned for 30 years in the UK, the country that has brought us, among other things, Johnny Rotten, Sid Vicious, the snivelling shits, and the charming custom of... I don't want to say it, it's a derogatory term for Asian people. Uh, it begins with a P. Uh, that word, bashing, anyway. God, it makes you proud to be British! So this bit here might not be politically correct, but I thought it was fascinating. Um, so he says, Take fat. How fat does a person have to be before he or she passes over the line and into a perversion of the human form severe enough to be called monstrosity? Surely it is not the woman who shops Lane Bryant or the fellow who buys his suits in that section of the menswear store reserved for the husky build, or is it? Has the obese person reached the point of monstrosity when he or she can no longer go to the movies or to a concert because his or her buttocks will no longer fit between the fixed armrests of a single seat? You will understand that I'm not talking about how fat is too fat here, either in the medical or aesthetic sense, nor anyone's right to be fat. I am not talking about the lady you glimpsed crossing a country road to get her mail on a summer day, her gigantic butt encased in black slacks, cheeks whacking and wobbling together, belly hanging out of an untucked white blouse like slack dough. 
I'm talking of a point where simple overweight has passed through the outermost checkpoints of normality and has become something that, regardless of morality or immorality, attracts the helpless eye and overwhelms it. I'm speculating on your reaction, and my own, to those human beings so enormous that we wonder about how they may perform acts that we mostly take for granted. Going through a door, sitting down in a car, calling home from a telephone booth, bending over to tie our shoes, taking a shower. He says, perhaps I've not touched your idea of monstrosity in real life even yet, and perhaps I won't, but for just a moment consider such an ordinary thing as left-handedness. Of course, the discrimin against left of course the discrimination against left-handed people is obvious from the start. If you've attended a college or high school with the more modern desks, you know that most of them are built for inhabitants of an exclusively right-handed world. Most educational facilities will order a few left-hand desks as a token gesture, but that's all. And during testing or composition situations, lefties are usually segregated on one side of the lecture hall so they will not jog the elbows of their more normal counterparts. The only known fuzz tone guitar track in existence was a technical mistake on a Marty Robbins country and western record. They adhered happily to school dress codes. Long sideburns were laughed at in most quarters, and a guy wearing stacked heels or bikini briefs would have been hounded unmercifully as a... Yes, Biggie, I know. He, he censored me, there we go. It was the F word for homosexual, a derogatory term. I'm going to try and avoid saying the terms. Eddie Cochran would sing about those crazy pink pegged slacks and kids would buy the records, but not the pants themselves. For the war babies, the norm was blessed. They wanted to be good. They watched for the mutant. Thought this was interesting. He says, Dr. Je he says, Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde was written at white heat by Robert Louis Stevenson in three days. It so horrified his wife that Stevenson burned the manuscript in his fireplace and then wrote it again from scratch in another three days. Um, but he also then mentions that again later. He kind of recycles the fact. He talks about Frankenstein here. He says, Frankenstein has probably been the subject of more films than any other literary work in history, including the Bible. The pictures include Frankenstein, The Bride of Frankenstein, Frankenstein Meets the Wolfman, The Revenge of Frankenstein, Blackenstein, and Frankenstein, 18, and Frankenstein 1980, to name just a handful. In light of this, summary would seem almost unnecessary, but as previously pointed out, Frankenstein is not much read. Millions of Americans know the name, not as many as know the name of Ronald McDonald, granted, now there is a real cultural hero, but most of them don't realise that Frankenstein is the name of the monster's creator, not the monster itself. A fact which enhances the idea that the book has become a part of Hatland's American myth pool, rather than detracting from it. It's like pointing out that Billy the Kid was in reality a tenderfoot from New York who wore a derby hat, had syphilis, and probably backshot most of his victims. People are interested in such facts, but understand intuitively that they aren't what's really important now, if indeed they ever were. One of the things that makes art a force to be reckoned with, even by those who don't care for it, is the regularity with which myth th swallows truth and without so much as a burp of indigestion. I want to read these as well, because these are some quotes from Frankenstein. I just think, I mean, Frankenstein's a, lo a great novel. I really enjoy it, so uh, definitely would recommend it. But this shows you why. Uh, so, on the grave robbery necessary to the task at hand. Who shall conceive the horrors of my secret toil as I dabbled among the unhallowed damps of the grave or tortured the living animal to animate the lifeless clay? My limbs now tremble, and my eyes swim with the remembrance. I collected bones from charnel houses and disturbed with profane fingers the tremendous secrets of the human frame. I kept my workshop of filthy creation. My eyeballs were starting from their sockets in attending to the details of my employment. And on the dream which follows the completion of the experiment. I thought I saw Elizabeth in the bloom of health, walking in the streets of Ingolstadt. Delighted and surprised, I embraced her, but as I imprinted the first kiss on her lips, they became livid with the hue of death. Her features appeared to change, and I thought that I held the corpse of my dead mother in my arms. A shroud enveloped her form, and I saw the grave worms crawling in the folds of the flannel. And I saw the grave worms crawling in the folds of the flannel. I started from my sleep with horror. A cold dew covered my forehead. My teeth chattered, and every limb became convulsed. When, by the dim and yellow light of the moon, as it forced its way through the window shutters, I beheld the wretch, the miserable monster whom I had created. He held up the curtain of the bed, and his eyes, if eyes they may be called, were fixed on me. His jaws opened, and he muttered some inarticulate sounds, while a grin wrinkled his cheeks. Biggie, can you be quiet, please? I'm trying to film. He wants to go into the porch, but I've just bleached the porch, like, and cleaned the floors, so he can't. You can't go out there, mate. Uh, and talking about Frankenstein, I thought this was interesting. He has a little footnote here. They do get a little annoying to read after a while, but he says, uh, Much of the story is unintentionally hilarious. The monster hides in a shed adjacent to a peasant hut. One of the peasants, Felix, just happens to be teaching his girlfriend, a runaway Arabian noblewoman named Safi, his language. Thus, the monster learns how to talk. His reading primers are Paradise Lost, Plutarch's Lives, and The Sorrows of Werther, books he has discovered in a cast-off trunk lying in a ditch. 
This Baroque tale within a tale is only rivalled in Defoe's Robinson Crusoe, when Crusoe strips naked, swims out to the foundering ship that has marooned him, and then, according to Defoe, fills his pockets with all sorts of goodies. My admiration for such invention knows no bounds. And now he says that, I do remember that happening as well. And I'm not sure if I'd necessarily agree with this, but I kind of see where he's going and do kind of agree with that. He says, uh, Mary Shelley is, let us bite the bullet and tell the truth. Not a particularly strong writer of emotional prose. Which is why students who come to the book with great expectations of a fast, gory read, expectations formed by the movies, usually come away feeling puzzled and let down. She's at her best when Victor and his creation argue the pros and cons of the monster's request for a mate like Harvard debaters. That is to say, she is at her best in the realm of pure ideas. So it's perhaps ironic that the facet of the book which seems to have ensured its long attractiveness to the movies is Shelley's splitting of the reader into two people of the opposing minds. The reader who wants to stone the mutation and the reader who feels the stones and cries out at the injustice of it. He's talking about Lovecraft here and he says, uh, The best of them make us feel the size of the universe we hang suspended in and suggest shadowy forces that could destroy us all if they so much as grunted in their sleep. After all, what is the paltry inside evil of the A-bomb when compared to Nyarlathot, the crawling chaos, or Yog sothoth the goat with a thousand young. That wasn't easy to say. And he's talking about a, fr a part of uh, Dracula when uh, the girl went down on her knees and bent over me, simply gloating. And I want to read this as kind of a chunky bit here. He says, In the England of 1897, a girl who went on her knees was not the sort of girl you brought home to meet your mother. Harker is about to be orally raped, and he doesn't mind a bit. So it, he's not about to be raped, right? Uh... If he's consenting, I don't, I'm not too sure. Uh, and it's all right because he is not responsible. In matters of sex, a highly moralistic society can find a psychological escape valve in the concept of outside evil. This thing is bigger than both of us, baby. Harker is a bit disappointed when the Count enters and breaks up this little tete-a-tete. -tete. Probably most of Stoker's, probably most of Stoker's wide-eyed readers were too. Similarly, the Count preys only on women. First Lucy, then Mina. Lucy's reactions to the Count's bite are much the same as Jonathan's feelings about the Weird Sisters. To be perfectly vulgar, Stoker indicates in a fairly, Stoker indicates in a fairly classy way that Lucy is coming her brains out. By day, an ever more pallid but perfectly Apollonian Lucy conducts a proper and decorous courtship with her promised husband, Arthur Homewood. By night, she carouses in Dionysian abandon with her dark and bloody seducer. In real life at this same time, England was experiencing a mesmerism fad. Franz Mesmer, the father of what we now call hypnotism, was at that time giving demonstrations of the feat. Like the Count, Mesmer preferred young girls and he would put them into a trance by stroking their bodies all over. Many of his female subjects experienced wonderful feelings that seemed to culminate in a burst of pleasure. It seems likely that these culminating bursts of pleasure were in fact orgasms, but very few unmarried women of the day would have known an orgasm if it bit them on the nose, and the effect, and the effect was simply seen as one of the pleasanter side effects of a scientific process. Many of these girls came to Mesmer and begged to be mesmerised again. The men don't like it, but the little girls understand, as the old rhythm and blues song goes. Anyway, the point made in regard to vampirism applies just as well to mesmerism. The culminating burst of pleasure was alright because it came from outside. She experiencing the pleasure could not be held responsible. Because heaven forbid, a woman should want some pleasure. Christ. And he talks about sexism and alien here, which I think is interesting because this is 1980 and you can tell by some of his word choices, King isn't necessarily the most woke. Um, I don't think it's a problem because I, I, for me personally, I think it's all about intent. So in here when he's used like the word, I'm going to say it now this time, the word faggot, for example, um, when, he, when he says that, you don't feel as though he's being homophobic, if that makes sense. Like, in, even when you read his character say shit like that, I personally find it easier to make the uh, distinction between the author and the characters, you know? Um, I think it sort of makes his stories and his writing more realistic, um, because it doesn't shy away from that side of society. Personally, I tend to avoid it in my writing, um, partly because you don't want a backlash, and um, partly just because... I don't think it's necessarily the point of the kind of stuff I write. I mean, if there was specifically a, a book that I was writing that was de like dealing with homophobia, then of course you'd want to use like faggot and other slurs like that um, to show, you know, that this is the reality of it. Anyway, um, so he says, I refer you, for instance, to Alien, where the two women crew members are presented in perfectly non-sexist terms until the climax, where Sigourney Weaver must battle the terrible interstellar hitchhiker that has even managed to board her tiny space lifeboat. During this final battle, Ms. Weaver is dressed in bikini panties and a thin t-shirt, every inch the woman, and at this point interchangeable with any of Dracula's victims in the hammer cycle of films in the 60s. The point seems to be, the girl was okay until she got undressed. 
I thought there was another extremely sexist interlude in Alien, one that disappoints on a plot level no matter how you feel about women's ability as compared to men's. The Sigourney Weaver character, who is presented as tough-minded in it, who is presented as tough-minded and heroic up to this point, causes the destruction of the mothership Nostromo and perhaps helps to cause the deaths of the two other remaining crew members by going after the ship's cat, enabling the males in the audience, of course, to relax, roll their eyes at each other and say either aloud or telepathically, isn't that just like a woman? It is a plot twist which depends upon a sexist idea for its believability and we might well understand and we might well answer the question asked above by asking in turn, isn't that just like a male chauvinist pig of a Hollywood scriptwriter? This, this gratuitous little twist doesn't spoil the movie, but it's still sort of a bummer. I mean, I'm not a woman and I would have gone after the cat. Actually, I wouldn't because I'm not brave enough. If anything, that to me shows her bravery that, you know, she was like, I'm not leaving it behind. I'm going to put myself at risk to rescue this other living being. being. Man, I wish I'd, I... Where's Biggie? He's not in here. I wouldn't go after him, especially if he was meowing while I was trying to film. It says, but it goes deeper than discrimination. The roots of discrimination spread wide, but the roots of monstrosity spread both wide and deep. Left-handed baseball players are all considered screwballs, whether they are or not. The French for left, bastardized from the Latin, is la sinistre, is la sinistre, from which comes our word sinister. According to the old superstition, your right side belongs to God, your left side to that other fellow. Southpaws have always been suspect. My mother was a lefty, and as a schoolgirl, so she and so she told my brother and me, the teacher would wrap her left hand smartly with a ruler to make her change her pen to her right hand. When the teacher left, she would switch the pen back again, of course, because, a white, because with her right hand she could make only large childish scrawls, the fate of most of us when we try to write with what New Englanders call the dumb hand. A few of us, such as Bramwell Bronte, the gifted brother of Charlotte and Emily, can write clearly and well with either hand. Bramwell Bronte was in fact so ambidextrous that he could write two different letters to two different people at the same time. We might reasonably wonder if such an ability qualifies as monstrosity or genius. And he points out here, uh, talking about like the sexualization of like the vampire novel and stuff, he says, Sex makes young adolescent boys feel many things, but one of them, quite frankly, is scared. The horror film in general, and the vampire film in particular, confirms the feeling. Yes, it says, sex is scary, sex is dangerous, and I can prove it to you right here and now. Sit down, kid, grab your popcorn, I want to tell you a story. And he says here, uh, if Bram Stoker serves as great wax of horror in Dracula, leaving us after Harker's confrontation with Dracula in Transylvania, the staking of Lucy Westenra, the death of Renfield and the branding of Mina, feeling as if we've been hit square in the chops by a two by four, then Stevenson's brief and cautionary tale, Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde, is like the quick mortal stab of an ice pick. And then he says here, about the Ramones, an amusing punk rock band that surfaced some four years ago, Linda Ronstadt is on record as saying, that music's so tight it's hemorrhoidal. He says here, oddly enough, only Stevenson was able to stoke the engine successfully more than once. His adventure novels continue to be read, but Stoker's later books, such as The Jewel of Seven Stars and The Lair of the White Worm, are largely unheard of and unread except by the most rabid fantasy fans. Um, I'm not necessarily a rabid fantasy fan, but I have read The Lair of the White Worm and I quite enjoyed that. Um, I, like, I like Bram Stoker, so that's why. He says, Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde is a masterpiece of concision. The verdict of Henry James, not myself. In that indispensable little handbook by Wilfred Strunk and E.B. White, The Elements of Style, the 13th rule for good composition reads simply, omit needless words. Along with Stephen Crane's red badge of courage, Henry James's The Turn of the Screw, James M. Kane's The Postman Always Rings Twice, and Douglas Fairbank and Douglas Fairbairn's Shoot, Stevenson's economy-sized horror story could serve as a textbook example for young writers on how Strunk's Rule 13, the three most important words in all of the textbooks ever written on the technique of composition, is best applied. Characterizations are quick but precise. Stevenson's people are sketched but never caricatured. Mood is implied rather than belabored. The narrative is as chopped and lowered as a kid's hot rod. He says, Talent is a dull knife that will cut nothing unless it is wielded with great force. A force so great that the knife is not really cutting at all, but bludgeoning and breaking. And after two or three of these gargantuan swipes, it may succeed in breaking itself, which may be what happens to such disparate writers as Ross Lockridge and Robert E. Howard. Discipline and constant work are the whetstones upon which the dull knife of talent is honed until it becomes sharp enough, hopefully, to cut, even, to cut through even the toughest meat and gristle. No writer, painter or actor, no artist, is ever handed a sharp knife, although a few people are handed almighty big ones. The name we give to the artist with a big knife is genius, and we hone with varying degrees of zeal and aptitude. I want to read this bit here. Uh, an adult is able to deal with the cataclysmic terror of something like the Texas Chainsaw Massacre because he or she understands that it is all make-believe and that when the take is done, the dead people will simply get up and wash off the stage blood. 
The child is not so able to make this distinction, and Chainsaw Massacre is quite rightly rated R. Little kids do not need this scene any more than they need the one at the end of The Fury where John Cassavetes qu quite literally blows apart. But the point is, if you put a little kid of six in the front row at a screening of the Texas Chainsaw Massacre, along with an adult who was temporarily along with an adult who was temporarily unable to distinguish between make-believe and real things, as Danny Torrance, the little boy in The Shining, puts it. If, for instance, you have given the adult a hit of Yellow Sunshine LSD about two hours before the movie started, my guess is that the kid would have maybe a week's worth of bad dreams. The adult might spend a year or so in a rubber room, writing home with Crayolas. Uh, he talks about the famous uh, Orson Welles War of the Worlds broadcast as well. At some other time, Mom told me that one of her sisters almost cut her wrists in the bathtub during the Orson Welles War of the Worlds broadcast. My aunt was not going about it hastily. She could look out the bathroom window and had, she said later, no plans at all to make the cuts until she saw the Martian death machines looming on the horizon. I guess you could say my aunt had found the Wells broadcast too upsetting. And my mother's words echoed down to me over the years like a voice in an uneasy dream that has never really ended. Too upsetting, upsetting, upsetting. Here he says, One of the paradoxes of fantasy and horror is that the writer of this stuff is like the lazy pigs who built their houses of straw and sticks. But instead of learning their lesson and building sensible brick houses like their oh so adult elder brother, memorialised in his engineer's cap forever in my memory by the Disney cartoon, the writer of fantasy and horror simply rebuilds with sticks and straw again. Because in a crazy kind of way, he or she likes it when the wolf comes and blows it all down. Just as he or she sorta of likes it when the gorilla escapes from its cage. Uh, he says, earlier on I talked about the suspension of disbelief, Coleridge's classic definition of what the reader must provide when seeking a hot shot from a fantasy story, novel or poem. Another way of putting this is that the reader must agree to let the gorilla out of its cage for a while, and when we see the zipper running up the monster's back, the gorilla goes promptly back into its cage. After all, by the time we get to be 40 or so, it's been in there for a long time, and perhaps it's developed a, and perhaps it's developed a bit of the old institutional mentality. Sometimes it has to be prodded out with a stick, and sometimes it won't go out at all. He says, I think that we'd all agree that one of the great fears which all of us must deal with on a purely personal level is the fear of dying. Without good old death to fall back on, the horror movies would be in bad shape. A corollary to this is that there are good deaths and bad deaths. Most of us would like to die peacefully in our beds at age 80, preferably after a good meal, a bottle of really fine vino and a really super lay. But very few of us are interested in finding out how it might feel to get slowly crushed under an automobile lift while crankcase oil drips slowly onto our foreheads. And he talks about the Amityville Horror as well, and he talks about the book by Jay Anson, which I've read. Uh, and he says, if we were going to discuss the book version of the Amityville Horror, we're not, so relax. It would be important for us to first decide if we were talking about a fiction or a non-fiction work. But as far as the movie is concerned, it, does, it just doesn't matter. Either way, it's fiction. He uh, mentions William Goldman and the Princess Bride here, and he says, um, If you doubt, see his wonderful setting up of fantasy and fairy tales, The Princess Bride. I can think of no other satire, with the possible exception of Alice in Wonderland, which is so clearly an expression of love and humour and good temper. So here uh, Stephen King talks about Elton John coming out and how it didn't really affect his career. He says, Elton, Elton John proclaimed his ACDC sexual proclivities and continued successful. Yet less than 20 years before, wild man Jerry Lee Lewis was blackballed from AM Airplay when he married his 14 year old cousin. Yeah, because Elton John is gay, whereas Jerry Lee Lewis married a 14 year old blood relative. Like, I, d I don't think those two are comparable, really. He says here, um, anti-civilizations don't go away and they demand periodic exercise. We have such sick jokes as, what's the difference between a truckload of bowling balls and a truckload of dead babies? You can't unload a truckload of bowling balls with a pitchfork. A joke, by the way, which I heard originally from a 10 year old. Such a joke may surprise a laugh or a grin out of us, even as we recall. A possibility which confirms the thesis, if we, share a brotherhood, if we share a brotherhood of man, then we also share an insanity of man. None of which is intended as a defense of either the sick joke or insanity, but merely as an explanation of why the best horror films, like the best fairy tales, manage to be reactionary, anarchistic, and revolutionary all at the same time. And now uh, here he talks about sort of some of the darkness that we have inside us, even as kids. He said, uh, consider this. Bring Bing Crosby is said to have told a story about one of his sons at the age of six or so who was inconsolable when his pet turtle died. To distract the boy, Bing suggested that they have a funeral and his son, seeming only slightly consoled, agreed. The two took a cigar box, lined it carefully with silk, painted the outside black and then dug a hole in the backyard. Bing carefully lowered the coffin into the grave, said a long heartfelt prayer and sang a hymn. At the end of the service, the boy's eyes were shining with sorrow and excitement. Then Bing asked if he would like to have one last look at his pet before they covered the coffin with earth. 
The boy said he would, and Bing raised the cigar box lid. The two gazed down reverently, and suddenly the turtle moved. The boy stared at it for a long time, then looked up at his father and said, Let's kill it. Here he's talking about Bella Lugosi, he says, There is no such frisson in Plan 9 from Outer Space, unfortunately, to which I reluctantly award the booby prize as the worst horror film ever made. Yet there is nothing funny about this one, no matter how many times it has been laughed at in those mostly witless compendiums which celebrate the worst of everything. There's nothing funny about watching a Bella Lugosi, who may actually have been a stand-in, racked with pain, a morphine monkey on his back, creeping around a Southern California development with his Dracula cape pulled up over his nose. Lugosi died shortly after this abysmal, exploitative, misbegotten piece of trash was released, and I've always wondered in my heart if maybe poor old Bella didn't die as much of shame as of the many illnesses that were overwhelming him. It was a sad and squalid coda to a great career. Lugosi was buried, at his own request, in his Dracula cape, and one likes to think or hope that it served him better in death than it did in the miserable waste of celluloid that marked his last screen appearance. He says it, so he goes between admiring and not admiring Stanley Kubrick in this book. He says, this factor of vision is so real and apparent that even when a director such as Stanley Kubrick makes such a maddening, perverse and disappointing film as The Shining, it somehow retains a brilliance that is inarguable. It is simply there. And then later on he recommends it as one of his like much must watch horror films. So I'm left not really sure what he thinks. Um, he talks here, he says, uh, The sort of horrors we have been discussing in this book labour under the very fact of their unreality, a fact which Harlan Ellison himself recognises well. He refuses to allow the word fantasy to be printed on book covers as a descriptive term for the stories inside. We have treated the question, why do you want to write horror stories in a world that is so full of real horrors? I am now suggesting that the reason horror has done so poorly, by and large on TV, is a statement which is closely related to that question, to wit, it is very difficult to write a successful horror story in a world which is so full of real horrors. A ghost in the turret room of a Scottish castle just cannot compete with thousand megaton warheads, CBW bugs or nuclear power plants that have apparently been put together from Aurora model kits by ten year olds with poor eye hand coordination. Even old Leatherface in the Texas Chainsaw Massacre pales beside those dead sheep in Utah killed by one of our finer nerve gases. If the wind had been blowing the other way that when that happened, Salt Lake City might have gotten a real good dose of what killed the sheep. And, my good friends, someday the wind is not going to be blowing the right way. I uh, like the sound of this story he mentions as well. He says, For the writer, the most galling thing about TV must be that he or she is forbidden from bringing all of his or her powers to bear. The predicament of the TV writer is strikingly similar to the predicament of the human race, as envisioned in Kurt Vonnegut's short story, Harrison Bergeron, where bright people are fitted with, ele where bright people are fitted with electroshock caps to disrupt their thinking periodically, agile people are fitted with weights, and people with great artistic talent are forced to wear heavy, distorting glasses to destroy their clearer perception of the world around them. As a result, a perfect state of equality has been achieved. But at what price? He says here, I want to talk here about two stories dealing with the archetype of the bad place, one good, one great. As it happens, both deal with haunted houses. Fair enough, I think. Haunted cars and railway stations are nasty, but your house is the place where you're supposed to be able to unbutton your armour and put your shield away. Our homes are the places where we allow ourselves the ultimate vulnerability. They are the places where we take off our clothes and go to sleep with no guard on watch, except perhaps for those ever more popular drones of modern society, the smoke detector and the burger alarm. Robert Frost said home is the place that when you go there, they have to take you in. The old aphorisms say that home is where the heart is. There's no place like home, that a heap of loving can make a house a home. We are abjured to keep the home fires burning, and when fighter pilots finish their missions, they radio that they are coming home. And even if you are a stranger in a strange land, you can usually find a restaurant that will temporarily assuage your homesickness as well as your hunger with a big plate of home-cooked home fries. It doesn't hurt to emphasise again that horror fiction is a cold touch in the midst of the familiar, and good horror fiction applies this cold touch with sudden, unexpected pressure. When we go home and shoot the bolt on the door, we like to think we're locking trouble out. The good horror story about the bad place whispers that we are not locking the world out. We are locking ourselves in. With them. And uh, he, he, he quotes here part of The Haunting of Hill House, which I read a couple of years ago and really enjoyed. He says, I think there are few, if any, descriptive passages in the English language that are any finer than this. Uh, so the passage... No live organism can continue for long to exist sanely under conditions of absolute reality. Even larks and katydids are supposed by some to dream. Hill House, not sane, stood by itself against its hills, holding darkness within. It had stood so for 80 years and might stand for 80 more. Within, walls continued upright, bricks met neatly, floors were firm and doors were sensibly shut. Silence lay steadily against the wooden stone of Hill House, and whatever walked there, walked alone. So yeah, he says, uh, I think there are a few, if any, descriptive passages in the English language that are any finer than this. It is the sort of quiet epiphany every writer hopes for. 
Words that somehow transcend words. Words which add up to a total greater than the sum of the parts. Analysis of such a paragraph is a mean and shoddy trick, and should almost always be left to college and university professors, those lepidopterists of literature who, when they see a lovely butterfly, feel that they should immediately run into the field with a net, catch it, kill it with a drop of chloroform, and mount it on a white board and put it in a glass case, where it will still be beautiful, and just as dead as horseshit. This is a, fantas a fantastic little quote here. I'm trying to figure out who it's from, because it, it comes from... Blimey. Because the whole point of this book, of course, is not so much the house and its peculiar, terrible power, but what effect it has on the neighbourhood, and on the relationships between neighbours and friends, and between families when they are forced to confront and believe the unbelievable. This has always been the power of the supernatural to me, that it blasts and breaks relationships between people and other people, and between people and their world, and, in a way, between people and the very essences of themselves. And the blasting and breaking leaves them defenceless and alone, howling in terror before the thing that they have been forced to believe. For belief is everything, belief is all. Without belief there is no terror. And I think it is even more terrible when a modern man or woman, girded round with privilege and education and all the trappings of the so-called good life and all the freight of the clever, pragmatic, vision-hungry modern mind, is forced to confront utter alien and elemental evil and terror. What does he know of this? What has it to do with him? What has the unspeakable and the unbelievable got to do with the second homes and tax shelters and private schools for the kids and a pate in every terrine and a BMW in every garage? Primitive man might howl before his returning dead and point. The neighbour would see and howl along with him. The resident of Fox Run Chase who meets a ghoulie out by the hot tub is going to be frozen dead in his or her Nikes on the tennis courts the next day if he or she persists in gabbling about it. And there he is, alone with the horror and ostracised on all sides. It is a double turn of the screw and I thought it would make a good story. He says, he writes here, uh, King, he says, Here is a novel which is written pretty good, as a friend of mine likes to put it. Meaning, of course, nothing special. No Sal Bellow, no Bernard Malamud, but at least not down there in steerage with people like Harold Robbins and Sidney Sheldon, who apparently wouldn't know the difference between a balanced line of prose and a shit and anchovy pizza. And then bearing in mind that King himself is a critic of Kubrick's film, he says, uh, In The Shining, the characters are snowbound and isolated in an old hotel miles from any help. Their world is shrunk and turned inward. The Overlook Hotel becomes a microcosm where universal forces collide, and the inner weather mimics the outer weather. Critics of Stanley Kubrick's film version would do well to remember that it was these elements, consciously or unconsciously, which, which Kubrick chose to accentuate. <laughs> this is um, some of the research that um, Shirley Jackson did when writing Haunting of Hill House, and it says, Shortly thereafter, she states, on a trip to New York, she saw at the 125th Street station a grotesque house, one so evil looking, one that made such a sombre impression that she had nightmares about it long afterward. In response to her curiosity, a New York friend investigated and found that the house, intact from the front, was merely a shell since a fire had gutted the structure. In the meantime, she was searching newspapers, magazines and books for pictures of suitably haunted looking houses, and at last she discovered a magazine picture of a house that seemed just right. It looked very much like the hideous building she had seen in New York. It had the same air of disease and decay, and if ever a house looked like a candidate for a ghost, it was this one. The picture identified the house as being in a California town. Consequently, hoping her mother in California might be able to acquire some information about the house, she wrote asking for help. As it happened, her mother was not only familiar with the house, but provided the startling information that Miss Jackson's great-grandfather had built it. And uh, King here, he, he rants about people who turn towards the end to see how the trick is done. He says, do you do this nasty, unworthy trick? Yes, you. I'm talking to you. Don't slink away and grin into your hand. Own up to it. Have you ever stood in a bookshop, glanced furtively around and turned to the end of an Agatha Christie to see who did it and how? Have, have you ever turned to the end of a horror novel to see if the hero made it out of the darkness and into the light? If you have ever done this, I have three simple words which I feel it is my duty to convey. Shame on you. It is low to mark your place in a book by folding down the corner of the page where you left off. Turning to the end to see how it came out is even lower. If you have this habit, I urge you to break it. Break it at once. And he says, I've always wanted to publish a novel with the last 30 pages simply left out. The reader would be mailed these final pages by the publisher upon receipt of a satisfactory summary of everything that had happened in the story up to that point. This would certainly put a spoke in the wheels of those people who turned to the end to see how it came out. Also, he criticises uh, P uh, William Peter Blatty. He says, uh, Blatty has fallen silent forever if we are lucky. And I like uh, William Peter Blatty. Maybe not his estate, because they sent me a takedown request the day after he died because they used a photo of him in a review of The Exorcist. And he talks about how we kind of try and find meaning in life. So he says, uh, I'm going to read, th this is a long old bit, but I think it's uh, really important. Earlier on, I mentioned the idea that perfect paranoia is perfect awareness. To that, we could add that paranoia may be the last defense of the overstrained mind. Much of the literature of the 20th century, from such diverse sources as Bertolt Brecht, 
Jean-Paul Sartre, Edward Albee, Thomas Hardy, even F. Scott Fitzgerald, has suggested that we live in an existential sort of world, a planless insane asylum where things just happen. Is God dead? asked the Time magazine cover in the waiting room of Rosemary Woodhouse's satanic obstetrician. In such a world, it is perfectly credible that a mental defective should sit on the upper floor of a little used building, wearing a Hanes t-shirt, eating takeout chicken, and waiting to use his mail order rifle to blow out the brains of an American president. Perfectly possible that another mental defective should be able to stand around in a hotel kitchen a few years later, waiting to do exactly the same thing to that defunct president's younger brother. Perfectly understandable that nice but Perfectly understandable that nice American boys from Iowa and California and Delaware should have spent their tours in Vietnam collecting ears, many of them extremely tiny. That the world should begin to move once more toward the brink of an apocalyptic war because of the preachings of an 80 year old Muslim holy man who is probably foggy on what he had for breakfast by the time sunset rolls around. All of these things are mentally acceptable if we accept the idea that God has abdicated for a long vacation or has perchance really expired. They are mentally acceptable but our emotions, our spirits and most of all our passion for order these powerful elements of our human makeup all rebel. If we suggest that there was no reason for the deaths of six million Jews in the camps during World War II, no reason for poets bludgeoned, old women raped, children turned into soap, that it just happened and nobody was really responsible, things just got a little out of control there, haha, <laughs> so sorry, then the mind begins to totter. He talks about something wicked this way comes by Ray Bradbury and sort of complains about it being underread and underappreciated. Which is fun because I read it, I don't know, about nine months ago. Oh, he uh, talks about the bo um, he, he describes shooting snooker and smoking cigars as uh, baser desires, which I think is a bit harsh because I love snooker. Ray Bradbury says that childhood is the time when you are still able to believe in things you know cannot be true. And I thought this was just amusing. He says, does anyone have the slightest doubt about what would happen if we were suddenly changed to a height of seven inches tall by malign magic and yon kitty curled up by the fire woke up and happened to see us skittering across the floor? Cats those amoral gunslingers of the animal world, and maybe the scariest mammals going. I wouldn't want to be up against one in a situation like that. I agree, man. Cats are nature's killing machines, aren't they? So I think this is interesting on the subject of fantasy fiction. He says, um, all fantasy fiction is essentially about the concept of power. Great fantasy fiction is about people who find it at a great cost or lose it tragically. Mediocre fantasy fiction is about people who have it and never lose it, but simply wield it. Mediocre fantasy fiction generally appeals to people who feel a decided shortage of power in their own lives and obtain a vicarious shot of it by reading stories of strong thewed barbarians whose extraordinary prowess at fighting is only excelled by their extraordinary prowess at fucking. In these stories we are apt to encounter a seven foot tall hero fighting his way up the alabaster stairs of some ruined temple, a flashing sword in one hand and a scantily clad beauty lolling over his free arm. LOL and I thought this was interesting because I'm 31 at the moment. He says, listen to me now, at 18 or 20 or 21, whatever the legal drinking age may be in your state, getting carded is something of an embarrassment. You have to fumble around for a driver's license or your state liquor card, or maybe even a photo stat of your birth certificate so you can get a simple, for Christ's sakes, glass of beer. But you let 10 years go past, get so you are looking the big 3-0 right in the eye, and there is something absurdly flattering about getting carded. It means you still look like you might not be old enough to buy a drink over the bar. You still look a little wet behind the ears. You still look young. So yeah, that's about all I have to share from you from Stephen King's Dance Macabre. Obviously, as you can tell, I kind of enjoyed it. I thought it was pretty fascinating. It would be more fascinating if it had more, you know, recent examples because a lot of the stuff is sort of before my time, really. But overall, uh, I mean, it's King. It was well written, well researched, and uh, I gave it a pretty strong four out of five, maybe even a four point two five out of five, and would recommend it to you if you're either either a Stephen King fan or a horror fan. So there we have it, that's what I made of Stephen King's Dance Macabre. As always, don't forget to let me know in the comments if you've read this book and if so, what you thought of it. Hit that like button if you've enjoyed this video. Hit subscribe for more and I will see you soon for another bookish video. Thanks a lot. Bye-bye.